Hello everyone, this is Ron Bush with Ron Bush Consulting and you're listening to the Information Playground. We're chatting with Larry Young today from Boiling Frog Development and uh, we've got a great program planned for you. Now the Information Playground is a, 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 a webcast, it's a, it's a podcast, it's a YouTube video, it's a, it's a radio, local FM radio program. It's all things designed to educate the listeners and it is, uh, it is something that I really hope that you'll, uh, you'll enjoy and, and derive benefit from today. Uh, you can find us on uh, Monday mornings at 8 a.m. or Friday afternoons at 1 p.m. If you're in Northwest Indiana on WVLP, uh, WVLP-FM is 103.1 on the FM dial, or it is WVLP.org, and I encourage you to, to uh, go to their website they do a lot in the community. They're a great radio station and a lot of great folks there. Uh, Greg Kovach is the station manager. He's a real nice guy. Uh, check him out. Stream us from that. And uh, if, you, uh, if you're so inclined, get involved in them. In you can get involved in helping the community. There's a lot of things that, uh, that people need help on nowadays. Also, find us on the Information Playground. Uh, that's uh, any of your podcast channels that you're interested in. Or you can uh, find us on YouTube with the same channel name, uh, The Information Playground. And with that, I'm going to introduce uh, our guest. Larry Young is uh, uh, a friend of mine. We're in uh, uh, a couple of things together. But rising from a shoe salesman to one of the youngest and successful market presidents for a top financial firm, Larry Young has never walked into an ideal selling situation. I can appreciate that. <laughs> Larry gained his experience in business development strategy with the small to mid-sized businesses on the streets and in real time. Larry gained a reputation as the market share resuscitator by share starting $400 million business lines from scratch and by turning markets left for dead into dominant players in their industry. His company, Boiling Frog Development, is one of the emerging business development strategy companies in the Southwest. He helps them to recognize how their business environment is changing and build strategies to adapt. And there couldn't be a better time for that than today. Absolutely. He's worked with hundreds of successful CEOs of diverse companies that lead wildly successful organizations. And he's collected a decade of what strategies work and which ones do not. Now as an author, professional speaker, and a business development strategist, Larry's audiences benefit from the knowledge of advanced growth strategies how to develop a clear vision and process for growth and building and retaining the winning team to pull it off. Welcome, Larry. Hey, thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure again. Uh, well, we're in the midst of COVID-19, so we're more than six foot distancing, but uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm looking forward to the day we don't have to and we can That's go right. grab some coffee or something. That's right. So given that we're in the midst of this pandemic, I, I'd like to think it's towards the end, but I'm beginning to doubt that. Um, let's discuss what a continuity plan is and what it really does for a business. Sure, sure. Well, I think, you know, continuity plans are, uh, are not only are they popular right now, but they're going to become even more popular, you know, as you start to, people start to think through and they're reinventing their organization and they're now companies that weren't virtual are now virtual. So they're thinking about how they survive. But what a what a continuity plan simply is just as the name denotes, it, it allows you the ability to put a process in place to continue your operations in the midst of a crisis. And that crisis could be a, you know, a tornado, a, a flood, a fire, uh, it could be a recession, it could be a pandemic. But those continuity plans are, are typically and much advised to be written plans that are well thought out that, that when something strikes, I know what I'm gonna do next. And I think it's one of the lifebloods of an organization. And a lot of times, Ron, what they touch on, I always call it the, some people say the five P's or the seven P's, it depends on how you define it, but it really is about what you're gonna do with your people, your place, you know, processes, procedures, the products you sell, partners you work with, those types of things. And that all comes down to a plan of what I'm gonna do amidst a crisis, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Well, I, I know you partner with uh, organizations to develop a business development strategy and you help position their organization in the center of their target market. Now, does this complement the idea of continuity planning or does it replace it? 
Yeah. So they work very closely together, Ron. They're kind of uh, cousins, if you will, So in a way. So let me explain. So what I, what I primarily do is I help organizations with their business development strategy, their competitive strategy to really differentiate against their competition. And in that process, that deep dive process, one of the things that I have organizations do is you find out who is your core customers or who, how do you really make money or, or what is it that is really your competitive advantage and looking at like your value chain, how do you produce the product that you normally produce? And that process takes business owners through this, this idea of saying, look, I know that I feel like I can be all things to all people, but really what is it that I really do? What is the piece that I have to protect? And so when you think about that, that's a, that's a competitive strategy or a business development strategy. Inside of the business continuity plan that we're talking about today, and I'm sure you'll ask me about it, but there's steps that you go through. And in that, there's, a, there's an impact analysis, a business impact analysis. And, and part of that assessment is understanding those things. So having a good feel for okay, if I'm going to worry about a tornado or a flood or a pandemic or something like that, what is it that I really have to protect? What is the piece of my business that I have to hold near and dear? I'll give you a, a, just an easy example if you think about it. Just take somebody oh, that sells like uh, clothing, right? That's just their, their, their business. So they're just they're simply just selling clothing to the public. But you've, you've been in stores and you've walked up there and at the, at the counter, there's always maybe there's some trinket necklaces or a few rings or some add-on. What do you call add-ons? And maybe they even got some Godiva chocolate, right? You know, so you can snag one on the way out the door. Well, those things are money makers. Those things are enhance their revenue and those types of things. But Ron, what they're not is they're not the core business, are they? Yeah. When, you, when you think about it, the core business is closed. So when I consult with businesses, a lot of times, some are very easy. Some, some businesses sort of know exactly, here's how I make money. You know, this is what I do. But a lot of times when you have multiple products or multiple services, sometimes we get lost in being able to protect that. And so when you get to the business continuity plan, when you get the leadership around, it's really paramount that you're sitting around and you understand that piece. Right. Because when you're doing a continuity plan, when you're trying to when you're trying to put that in and we go through the steps of that, when you're trying to go, that, that's not the time to figure out how you make money. Right. You, that's what the strategic plan is. And so I think really just trying to look at those two. So they're very related. One other quick thing to think about is when you're when you're thinking about a strategic plan, one of the things that I do with organizations is I make sure that they understand their value chain. They make sure they understand like who are all their suppliers. So just imagine a scenario, Ron, where you had a business where you you had maybe two or three different suppliers. So you felt like you were diverse, right? But what if all three of those suppliers got their product from Wuhan or New York City? <laughs> Right. And so now you have this risk. And so what a continuity plan, much like a strategic plan does, is it makes you think at a deep level through those issues and protect yourself in a downside. You know, throughout the years, I've worked with different companies and advised different companies to have business continuity plan. Uh, I'm just looking at my notes here, a disaster recovery plan, a disaster preparedness plan. Uh, because of what I do, cybersecurity, uh, information security policies and procedures are vital nowadays. Um, you mentioned a strategic plan. How, how are these similar and how are, what are the differences between all of these things? Yeah, so the, the strategic plan, um, really when I sit down with businesses, is really more of a focus on, okay, Tell me what you want. First of all, who are your ideal customers? Who are you selling to? And then what is that value chain? We talked about a little bit in the selling when we talked about the selling and the leadership podcast you and I did where, where we talked about knowing your customers and knowing what value they want. And then backfilling and looking through your process, your value process to be able to say, am I doing these things? Am I able to um, uh, be able to have all the steps in place to deliver that? So, you know, if you think about it, take Ikea as an example, you know, clearly they're home furnishing and everybody knows that. But Ikea is has a total different strategy, business strategy than 
somebody else like a regular furniture store. I mean, Ikea has every step of the way in their value chain process to be able to lead to low prices for people for your do it yourselfers. So when you walk into Ikea as an example, as a really good example, first of all, you can't get in and out of Ikea, right? They, 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 they have the displays and you got to go through there and then you got to write everything down and then you go down through. And you, if you remember, you go to, if you've been there, you go through the warehouse and you find it. So you do it yourself. It comes in boxes, which you can load, you load right out front. So I could go on and on, but the point of Ikea, Ikea is that their value chain and their strategic plan every step of the way is designed to give you great products you can do yourself at a low price. That's a strategic plan and I would tell you that by and large and this is just informally but through my experience 70% of businesses don't take that step to understand that each step along the way they try to get better. That's a strategic plan but where that differs from a, a business continuity plan is think about, think about the continuity plan is designed to say all of that that I learned, mm -hmm. I just need to protect that now. So let me sensitize that process to a, a recession, a hurricane, a pandemic. You know, what would that look like? How would we continue to, to deliver that value, you know, to, to those clients? And understanding what your value is and that customer end is the heart of a strategic plan. It's a heart of a competitive strategy because what you're doing is then you're answering that and you're making sure you're protecting that. So that's always there. I'll give you just a, a quick to show you the difference, but think about McDonald's as an example. So McDonald's, their value chain goes all the way back to the potato farmer that they buy from. So if they have a, if they have bad fries, like we, everybody likes McDonald's fries, right? So if they have a bad batch of fries, they can't blame the farmer, right? Their value chain and how they get it, how they deliver, how they buy them all gives you McDonald's fries. Now, at the end of the day, McDonald's fries are great when I want to take, when I want to take my young boys on a Saturday and let them eat McFries and play in the, the playground, right? Uh -huh. Right. But, but it isn't a place that that Saturday night I would take my wife on her anniversary, right? So they know exactly what their, 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 their key is and that value. And so they have to protect that. So things that they're probably doing on a business continuity plan are how do I protect against a potato famine or how do I protect against, you know, things of that nature that supply those. And that's what they're probably planning for by and large. Disaster preparedness. How would that be different? Well, your disaster preparedness would be what it's, it's almost at a, just a basic level. We can go as deep as you want, but it's more of a what if scenario. So what, what would happen if there was a drought in Idaho, as an example, we can't get potatoes. Where do, where do we go next? You know? And so that in the, in the business continuity plan, there's kind of a risk assessment piece that people do. And, and, and that's really, well, what's the likelihood of that happening? So does McDonald's might have in that example might have, 50 different farmers they go to. So if one region of, I'm just making this up, but if Idaho gets wiped out, you know, is there 25 others that, that can fill that order, so right. to speak? Yeah. I'm working with a company right now on their information security policies and procedures. And much as you've alluded to, there's overlap between this and all the rest of them. Uh, I'll use, I'll use an, a, a company that I used to own as an example we provided uh, digital or, or electronic health records for hospitals. So we had to have uh, backups. We had to have redundancy built into everything. So um, we had, uh, we had a, a cable company that I won't mention at this time. Um, we had their cable in, but if somebody cut the cable, this was in a business uh, park, a lot of warehouses and, and things in there. And there was always construction going on. Somebody cut that cable, I was done. You know, I was, I was, I was dead uh, because hospitals couldn't access their records. So I had to have an alternative source for a, a backup to that. Information security policies and procedures or all that kind of stuff and more because they get into uh, understanding what your risks are. And part of those risks will be uh, that, uh, you know, that, that source of, of whatever you need, whether it's electricity, or it's, uh, I don't know, it's uh, internet, whatever it might be, and, and building redundancy, but it's also a redundant server. It's also uh, all kinds of 
of uh, uh, what your risks are, how do you mitigate those risks, uh, employee training. I mean, a zillion things come into that. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned steps before we leave business continuity, and, and I'd like to after this, but, um, but before we do, give us, I don't know, four or five steps, things that, that somebody can walk away and say, this is where I need to start to a business continuity plan. Yeah, so um, there, there's a there's a couple ways that um, that a, a business can go about it. Did you want to go through the the six steps? Is that Ron where you want to take us right now, or? Um, yeah, we can we can just name them and then move on. We can come yeah. back to it later if we have time. Yeah. So the so the so the key parts in this, and there's a couple points I would cover with those if we have time. But you know, first you have to identify the goals. What is it that I that I really want to accomplish? Secondly, you've got to identify a team, you know, who's the, who's the business continuity team. There has to be one within the organization. I alluded to the business impact analysis, which is one of the crucial pieces, you know, in terms of, of being able to sort through if a cut cable as, as an example. Uh, the, the, the fourth one is to really maintain your operations. What is it that you can do to continue to maintain and how do you keep business as usual? Fifth, you want to do testing and follow-up. So that's kind of like the fire drill in school, right? Where they have us go do that all the time. You know, that's really what that is. And then the maintenance, which is the adaptation, you know, that you're constantly revising that throughout the year. And, uh, and as you can see, I would imagine there's a lot of continuity plans right now that are going to add the whole idea of, of Zoom and pandemics. Now, something that a year ago, you know, you and I wouldn't have laughed at it, but you would have thought, mm, very unlikely, you know, and now all of a sudden you realize not so much. So, yeah, yeah. I, since I've been preaching this sermon, at least on uh, InfoSec policies and procedures and disaster planning, I've been preaching that sermon for years and gotten either resistance or, or avoidance or being ignored uh, as a result. I really hope that does change and I, I, I expect that we'll see uh, a lot, a lot better adaptation to it. So, in your past in banking and working with business owners, you saw some companies fall in the past recessions. And even now, I, I think, um, I, I don't know what the latest figures are, but I at one point had heard about a 3% contraction in uh, gross, uh, uh, gross international production, yeah. uh, not domestic, international, uh, which would be a worldwide uh, depression or recession. Why should all businesses prepare for this? Yeah, that um, there's a there's a there's a couple of things that I would I would say. You know, I, I'm not a big cliche guy, but it's kind of that idea, Ron. If that if you fail to plan, plan to fail. You know, we've heard, we've all heard that. And so I just did a podcast not more than two or three weeks ago. It was around strengthening your balance sheet uh, post recession. And the idea was once we get through this and people return to profitability how are you starting to strengthen your company? And so I shared with them, I don't know, 11, 12 different ways, things to think about to strengthen. That's part of the mitigation in a business continuity plan. Companies that don't focus on improving their financial metrics are the ones that struggled the most, I remember in 2008. But companies that really took a proactive stance, not only around building uh, their, their balance sheets and their, their, you know, the profitability of the company, but also kind of looked at things like, okay, in a recession, you know, who is it that still spends money, you know? And so some like me, I'd have engineering companies that would say, look, I'm going to try to increase my government work because governments still tend to spend. In 2008, you remember the shovel ready projects and things of that nature at that time. And those were ways in which businesses really tried to survive. So they would, they would really focus on, hey, can I get a, a, a 18 month or a two year contract? Maybe that doesn't pay as well, right? It's not the greatest paying, but it's constant income mm -hmm. towards that thing. Now that's part of a strategic plan, but it's also part of a continuity plan. And, 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 and so it helps them to survive during those times. I'll give you something that's alarming. You, you know, you talk about watching businesses fail. Nothing in the, when I was in banking is worse than going through that. But uh, I think it was on ready.gov. I, I, I saw uh, FEMA did some, some studies and this is shocking. So it almost goes to the first, when you, when you ask why do a plan, this is how I should have answered it. What they said was, was that after a crisis like this, 43% of businesses will never reopen. 
Doesn't that make, I mean, that is just staggering to think yeah. about four out of six, 51% will close within one year and 75% will fail within three. Why is that? Well, there's a couple of things that go. Now, this is the strategic hat speaking, but there, but there's a couple of things that go into that. One is that they don't strengthen their balance sheet. They don't, something like this wipes out their capital or their liquidity or cash or whatever that is, and they don't have the ability to survive. You know, and so then even if they, we get through this, they're just hanging on by a thread and you know how that is, then anything goes awry. You've got, you know, you've got a problem. Right. And the, uh, and, and the second thing is, is that they don't maybe pivot and, and move their business after it. They just believe that it's just going to be business as usual. And so they don't adapt that type of thing. And that, those two things are really a lack of continuity planning run. And really preparing. And that's what I saw a lot of in 2008. I see it now, right, already with businesses I'm talking to now. You know, I'm getting them late stage in the game sometimes. So, Is it too late for people that didn't plan? And is there a reason that they didn't? Well, I, I think every, everyone's different. You know, it depends on, on what kind of industry that you're in. It depends on, you know, whether this is, you know, you still have access to kind of some of the essential jobs or when this turns, will they be up and going? So some organizations will lag by six to eight months. Well, if they haven't planned for that, they're probably in more dire. So when you think about continuity planning, and you probably talk about this in the cybersecurity world, you know, there's, a, there's the planning and preparing piece, right, which is that piece. And then you're thinking about the, your disaster response, and then there's a rebuild phase. Well, unfortunately, is it too late? Really is you've got some companies, Ron, that are probably didn't plan for it. And now they're thinking about rebuilding right now and think about how hard that is. So I'll give you a, a really good example. Um, about a month ago, I visited with a, a construction company and this, this construction company, well, originally when they called me, they said, look, we wanna do some business development strategy. We wanna grow, we wanna learn how to do all this stuff. And so in the initial consultation, I'm having a conversation with them and it isn't very long before I realize that we're really not talking about strategic planning. We're really talking about survival. We're trying to find revenue very, very fast. And one of the things that I asked them and I said, okay, you're, you're already, you, you didn't plan, you didn't prepare, we're, we're way past disaster. Now you're just trying to find revenue. And I asked them, I said, well, what is the most profitable segment of your business that you could replicate right now, right? What is it that you can do? Because right now the goal, because we didn't plan, is to extend, extend the two months worth of cash that you have into six or seven and hope that this passes and then you're back up and going. And luckily for this company, they had three to $4,000 email or contacts of past customers that they had done business with. I said, let's get on the phone. Let's start, let's start dialing and, and that type of thing. I mean, you've got, I mean, they're handyman, right? And they're construction. So you've got a lot of moms and dads that are sitting quarantined at home, looking around going, you know, that ceiling fan's wobbly and there's cracks in there. I mean, let's start reaching out to them. And, and this company is having some success. You know, fortunately it's a good, it's a good story, but when they get through it, Ron, they're going to have to plan. Then yeah. they're going to have to put a, a business continuity plan in place and they're going to have to strengthen their business. But the, the problem that they had is they couldn't answer what their core business was. So if you don't know what your core business is, then what do you, how do you know what to protect in a continuity plan? Right. Excellent point. Where do business uh, owners get started or obtain resources? Well, there's a, there's a number of ways. Um, I'm a big fan of um, SBDC. So it's SBDC, which is, is short for Small Business Development Center. So like in Tucson, where you're at, Phoenix has them. They're all throughout the country, and sometimes they're a little more centralized. But these people are great. It's, it's a part of uh, SBA, uh, and it's part of that SCORE SBA relationship. And so they're fed, federally funded, but they've got top-notch people. Sometimes they're people that have ran businesses before. Maybe they're ex-bankers or, or whatever the case. But anyways, they, they're, there's some things out there that you can go on your SBDC and you can find powerful resources around strategic planning, around business continuity planning, things of that nature. And that's a place to start. That's a, that's a free place to start. And they have counselors too. 
where what I always tell people, Ron, is those resources, if you want to go online and find resources for business continuity plan, you can do that and the leadership team can print it off and they can just kind of kind of work through it. The second phase is, is you know, bringing in somebody like, like you for cybersecurity, that type of piece, me, maybe more for the business development core piece strategy and helping them think through things they hadn't thought of or they may not be able to think of, not on their own, but we just have perspective, right? And, and that's, or they can go to a, to a, a full kind of simulated, um, you know, workout type thing. It just depends on what they, it depends on what their goal is realistically. But those resources are out there. I encourage people to use them to start formulating those opinions and then go from there. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. Well, we're coming up on a break. So if you would, um, let's tell folks how they can get in touch with you and then I'll, uh, I'll do my, uh, my identification business. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the easiest way is to email me at boilingfrogdevelopment at gmail.com. So boilingfrogdevelopment at gmail.com. You can also check out my website, Boiling Frog Development, Facebook page, the same, uh, or LinkedIn under Larry Young. You'll find me there. But those are easy ways to message me, and then we exchange details. And typically, Ron, I just consult at first, you know, just in a consultation, just to see what they're after before we do anything or if there's any way that I can help them. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Well, you are listening to the Information Playground. Uh, my name is Ron Bush. I own Ron Bush Consulting. We underwrite this on uh, WVLP-FM. Uh, that's 103.1. If you're in Northwest Indiana, and in particular Valparaiso, you've got a good opportunity to listen to us on uh, 103.1 at 8 a.m. on Mondays and 1 p.m. on Fridays. However, if you prefer to listen to us on demand, you can find us under the channel name, The Information Playground, and it is The Information Playground. Um, it's, uh, it, you can find us on just about any podcast platform, Spotify, Apple podcast, uh, Google podcast, all the rest of them, or you can find the video on YouTube under the name, the information playground, uh, Ron Bush consulting is a cybersecurity consultancy. Uh, if you're interested in, in getting in touch with us, email me. It's really easy. It's Ron at ronbushconsulting.com. I like keeping things simple when I can. So that's, uh, that's what we do. Um, so you mentioned uh, uh, SBDC. I used to be a mentor for SCORE. Oh, you and were. so I would add that to the list of resources. Yeah. SBDC is an excellent one. And for our conversation, uh, might be more appropriate. SCORE is, uh, used to stand for Service Corps of Retired Executives, I think. Yeah, that's right. Um, that's right. I was not retired, but I was an executive. So they let me in. Time got in the way and I just, uh, I kind of dropped out of being that mentor, but it's an excellent organization. Yeah, and, it's usually uh, filled with great people that give a lot of their time and talent and treasures to, uh, to help business owners survive. And so there's some great counseling there. Yeah. Indeed, yeah. I couldn't agree more. So you mentioned before we got on the air that uh, you walk business owners through six steps. So we, we identified those six steps Let's come back to them and let's talk about them individually now. I, okay. I made my notes. The first thing we're going to do is identify goals. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, what are the, so all six of the steps I always, are, are, are equally important. Some are just easier and kind of a quicker process, but they all kind of like, just like your finger, you know, they just kind of intertwine together and that's what makes a continuity plan great. Identifying goals is one of the one of the most powerful things you can start with and what you're really trying to accomplish and I alluded to it before break, but is is your goal in part process wise, are you is it something you're just going to do yourself, you got your years an organization you're going to brainstorm through and, and that's just good enough right we've got that that's good enough. Or do you want to bring in subject matter experts might be a next phase. So cybersecurity, you know, clearly you're one of the top in the, in the nation in, in regards to that. And so bringing you in, you know, to, for, for that particular piece, or like I said, do you, do you want a continuity plan? That's like a virtual simulation, you know, where you're really kind of, how robust do you want it to be? The other part of the goals, Ron, and I think people overlook this, or I think they miss the mark on it. So we'll call this a tip, if you will. But you need to define what you're trying to protect. And so when you think about the clothing store example, do you really need to spend time planning on the Godiva chocolate as a, as a just kind of a fun analogy? 
you know, or is it that really we want to make sure that, okay, this is our core business. These are our core customers. These are the people that handle the core customers. And then this is the process to make sure that their world goes smooth. And so setting goals becomes really, really important because you can spend a lot of time on a continuity plan. You can also blow it off and not do enough. So what is it you're trying to accomplish? Mm -hmm. I don't want my business to shy at all, or I just going to make sure that I can get by for 12 to 18 months. Part of the goals ties into, I think what we were talking about earlier when I said strengthen the balance sheet, you know, making sure you have enough cash and assets and things of that nature to survive. You know, if you have a lot of those, then, then you probably want to protect those so to speak. And so you got to set goals. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Um, identify the team. This is really crucial uh, because you, the, the way to really start this is, is you identify the team. So, so you've probably been around organizations where you get voluntold, you know, we always <laughs> call voluntold. And, uh, uh, but you want people that are really engaged in this, you know, people that are going to own this, like it's, you know, a big part of their job. A lot of times in smaller organizations, small to midsize, it's an add on for somebody. It's like, oh, here's something else I have to do. So getting people that are engaged and understand the importance, like right now, it's not all that hard, is it? To engage people, people get it, right? But yeah. a year ago, not so much. So I think that's part of it. The other piece that's really cruel when you're thinking about identifying the team is who are your subject matter experts? You know, who, who understands the value chain, like at McDonald's, like we said, who, who owns this piece or whatever your business is, who owns this, or do they have access to bring in a subject matter expert? So by and large, most companies that are small to midsize, well, probably small to, yeah, probably small to midsize don't have a cybersecurity expert on staff. They probably have an IT person, right, that understands IT, but they don't have a cyber security expert that is understands what's going on out there, the latest threats, the, the I'm, I'm speaking out of tongue, but the, the, the biggest pitfalls, right? In, in, in right current, on target. Yeah, in current protection systems and things, you know, what, what are they seeing out there? And so those, bringing those subject matter experts in like you for that situation is, is, a, is a big deal. Because what you're going to do by and large, not only are you going to be up to date on stuff, but you're also, I know that I, cause I know you well, you're going to make them think about things that they never thought about before. You know, I'm, I'm often reminded, I've heard it attributed to Einstein as well as Viktor Frankl, that the definition of, his, of insanity is doing the same thing, but expecting a different result. I don't really know who said that to begin with, but, but I can tell you that's what most businesses, that's mostly the way they operate. Yeah. We've got an IT director, team, person, a consultant, and and we're fine. He's been working with us for years and, and no problem. Okay, so first off, do you even know if you've been hacked? And chances are you don't. The average company does not until six to eight months in. And look at the Marriott. If there's a company that ought to be aware of cybersecurity, it's the Marriott group, and they were hacked for four years and yeah. didn't know it. Didn't so, even, didn't even know uh, and then they just got hacked again recently. Yeah. So the, the first hack was 500 million people. That's half a billion people. Uh, it's more than what occupy the United States of America. Yeah. Uh, the second hack was just 5 million, but you know, that's still a lot of people, 5 million. Yeah. So, um, so you're exactly right. That's where I walk in is making them look at things that they haven't looked at, asking them questions they haven't asked and bringing them up to speed on what real world risk and what have you are. You would do, I would think the exact same thing. And I know you've worked with uh, hundreds of companies. Uh, you've, you've helped hundreds of them become successful at what they do for the very same reason. You walk into that with a fresh pair of eyes to their, uh, their situation. You're looking at things, not as someone who's looking at it every day. I mean, we all get used to the, paints, uh, you know, if I don't look over there, I won't see that paint cracked or I won't right. see that nail pop, yeah. but you're going to see it. You're going to walk in and you're going to look around and you're going to see it. And you're going to know what the, what the most successful things to do, because you've got the experience that tells you that. That's absolutely right. And when you think about, you know, I was on your uh, podcast, it was some time ago, but when I, 
uh, when I wrote the book, Walk the Sales Plank. You know, the, the, the basis of that, that whole entire book was off the, the idea that if you're going in to sell and you're just pitching something, then you're really not providing any type of high level value. But when you go in as a sales professional and you're offering them insights and things that they haven't even thought of, or that maybe you've just got a different spin on, that's where the value is created in the sales process, right? Mm -hmm. And so for, for you and, and in this, and this whole idea of the subject matter experts is really bringing somebody in with the whole goal of simply just saying, tell me what I don't know. Right. So Ron, come into my company and tell me what I don't know, because there's no way that Boiling Frog Development has the, the horsepower to be able to understand all of that type of stuff. And so tell me what I don't know. And so a lot of the uh, bringing those people in on your business continuity plan or the strategic plan like I do, that's what it's all designed to do is tell you what you maybe haven't thought of yeah. and share Excellent. best share best practices. Yeah. Excellent. So business. Uh, Impact. I can't read my writing. Business impact. Oh, the um, impact analysis. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, I, I was rolling them off pretty quick. So you're, you're doing great. You're doing great. Uh, the business impact analysis is really, um, is really where you, the inside of there is kind of the risk assessment. So this is what is the likelihood of a tornado? So a tornado in, in Phoenix, Arizona is, has a very small probability versus someplace in South Dakota or Indiana. You know, there's just, a, there's just a difference. But then the business impact analysis is really to make you sit through. And this is where that core, that piece that I was talking about in the strategic plan, this is where you start to say, okay, if we lost, went down for a, a week, a day, a week, a month, what would that look like? You know, how would we be able to survive in that environment? What would that cost us? Because dollars or dollars lost, you know, revenue loss, profitability loss, that's the impact. So what does it really do to impact my organization? And so then that way, if there's, a, let's say, a total loss, a tornado just takes your, your building out, so to speak. Okay, what are the core things that we need to do? Here's my core customers I got to take care of. Here's the processes that we have to have in place. Here's the products. And you're thinking about those things. This is the one when you and I, and you see this in your world too, like I do, this is the one where you're really sitting down and making them think through it. Yeah. And, and you challenge a lot of why and tell me why you think that way. And have you ever thought about this? And that's the value that you bring. Well, you're exactly right. You, you know, you sit down with someone and you mentioned like you just did the tornado. Well, you know, they've never been hit by a tornado. So why would they expect for one to hit them tomorrow? And yet mm -hmm. nobody expects that to happen. Nobody. nobody expects a fire to destroy their building that's or right. a pandemic to hit us that stops all business just about. That's right. Um, no when, you think, when you think about it, you know, when I was in banking for a long time, you know, the, we, we use one of the things that you do, you know, as a, as a banker, especially a commercial banker, is you're asking those questions, you know, you're asking questions like, well, tell me what would happen with this and tell me how you protect yourself from this because we're lending millions of dollars and banks are in the habit of getting paid back, right? So, so you'd have to kind of understand what that risk was and you'd have to ask them, you know, well, tell me what would happen if, you know, this would happen. But one of the things that we used to do, Ron, is we used to talk a lot to business owners about like succession planning. So what happens, like, let's say, Ron, there's you and let's say you have kids that are involved in the business and how do you pass that on? And God forbid something happened to you, you know, what, what would that look like? And it was amazing uh, how many people just don't want to talk about it. Yeah. They just, uh, either they, whether it's mortality or whatever the case is, they don't want to talk. It's just negative. Yeah. And unfortunately, I can attest that I've seen what happens when they don't, when, 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 it, when it does not go the way anybody wants it to go. And then everybody's sitting there and businesses close and things of that nature. A continuity plan is very much similar. Well, when would a pandemic hit? You know, or, oh, we're never going to have a drought in Arizona. Who, you know, I'm joking. <laughs> you know, a uh, no hurricane, you know, but at the end of the day, uh, we don't think that stuff will happen. And maybe the risk assessment will say that's fairly low, you know, and that's part of that piece. But then what if, what will we do? And then go from there. Yeah, yeah. No, definitely. Those are things that everyone needs to, uh, everyone needs to, to take a look at. Um, uh, you know, unfortunately, I, I couldn't emphasize more strongly than what you just did, how people don't want to dwell on the negative. You know, I, I'm a real positive guy. 
but I realize if you don't if you don't plan for the negative, um, you know you, you may not be around to have positive. You just have to take a look at what can happen and prepare for that. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I always hope for the best, yeah. but you know, I usually don't get either extreme. I usually don't get the worst happening to me, and I don't get the best happening to me. I get somewhere in the middle. Yeah. And the more I prepared for this, the more I'm happy with that. That's right. The more I get to experience the happy. Well, the interesting thing is that there's studies out there that will show that people, we as humans, we by and large, we fear loss more than we fear the loss of gain. Yeah. But but I think that there's a piece of I almost call it kind of the the teenager mentality that oh it'll never happen to me right I'm I'm gonna live forever and and so we just <laughs> don't plan for it and then all of a sudden when it does I think that then Ron is that 43 or 51 or that 75 percent that close. I referenced earlier, I think that's what ends up happening. Yeah. And then, yeah. Last I checked, no one here, no one gets out alive. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, maintain operations. Number four. So yeah, so, yeah. So maintain operations is really uh, that that's where um, you probably, again, you probably see it. I see it where, where you're really drilling down into, okay, we've, you've identified the, the risk assessment or right, here's the probability of this happening. Here's the impact area. Now, how would operations flow? Let's think through the process. And that's, that's kind of the boring part that nobody wants to really do as much. You know, that's not as flashy, but that's, that's the nuts and bolts of it. So you think about like when, when, uh, when I was in banking, you know, we had steps, you know, if, 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 if the bank was wiped out by a, by a tornado, we all knew where to go. If, there was, if the bank was going to be closed, we had a calling procedure. But this is where you detail out step by step. And by and large, Ron, this is the piece that I think that business owners miss a lot of times. They, they do it, but you should make it this part at almost like I could hand you Boiling Frog Development's continuity plan and you would be able to step into my absence and flow through that. Right. Exactly. That, that's how you want it to do. So in a cybersecurity tag, you know, boom, here's what this, this, this looks like. Here's the steps. And what that does is that mitigates that loss because you're usually on it right away. This, that's one of the more powerful things to do. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. In fact, I tell my clients on the InfoSec policies and procedures, this is a living, breathing document. It's yes. going to change and we've got to be attuned to that. Uh, we need to review it at least annually, at a minimum annually. And we need to update it we, because everything's going to change. Yeah. Everything that you're doing today is going to be different a year from now. And it may <laughs> yeah. be different six months from now. Yeah. So we've got to do that. And I, I know it's the same with you. I'm just talking about cybersecurity. You're yeah. talking about all the business practices. That's right. You can only imagine the changes there. That's right. Um, test and follow-up. Boy, I can't think of... All of these are so important. I keep wanting to emphasize one over the other. No, yeah, they're not. They're they wrong. just, they, again, it's like a, it's like a woven basket. You know, they just, they're there to support mm -hmm. and they all kind of tie together. But the testing and the follow-up, I joked earlier, that's like the fire drill at school, you know, yeah. keep doing it, keep doing it so that everybody knows what to do. I'll tell you a funny, um, so, so in banking, back when I was in banking, you know, banking has, you know, we still, we have the, the drills. Uh, we have all the things that we need to protect from, you know, back when I was back in the Midwest fire things, you know, we, and we're, and, and auditors come in to make sure that we understand this because there's transactions. There's, so there's a lot in banking, uh -huh. but uh, one of them that is really paramount is of course, banks have rob get robbed. Right. And so there's a continuity plan for that, but there's also design for the protection of team members because, they care. The team members are the most important. Well, anyways, uh, so we have these opening procedures in bank and you follow these so that robbery, so you can, this is kind of the, the uh, plan so that, so that something bad doesn't happen. Well, there's times when robbers will stay, they'll hide and they'll stay overnight. And then when the first person comes into the bank, you know, now you've got one person in the bank and then that's sometimes, I, there's a name for it, I forget what it's called, but irregardless. So we put procedures in place that prevent some type of continuity, you know, any type of disaster. And I wouldn't give it, give it so much away because banks use this to protect themselves. But the idea is if I was the market president, when I would go in, I'd be the first one in typically then there would be a way for the team members to know that I was safe or not, that they could visualize from outside. And if they 
saw that it was safe, they would come in. If they didn't, they were not supposed to come in. So I take over this market, right? And, and they are not doing well at this, you know? And then we're coming up on where we're gonna be tested by the auditors. I'm like, look, we gotta get this right. I mean, cause this is serious. Not only we gotta get it for the audit, but safety of team members. And they're just not getting it, Ron, you know, they're just not. So finally I'm fed up. So what I did is I went in early one morning and right when you walked in the foyer, I put up a big, uh, one of those white easels, you know, the, the race board and I went, welcome, you know, and, and put it right there so it would catch their attention. Then I grabbed my, my youngest boys at that time, you know, those big Nerf guns that shoot uh -huh. those suction cups. <laughs> so I stood up behind a desk where they couldn't see me because they didn't, I didn't put the code up that said it was safe to come in. And here they do. They just come walking in because Again, you don't want them pile up. And so once they would get close to that board, boom, I would shoot that suction cup right, right, at, the, right at the easel. And they, they jump, you know, and, and we kind of made fun out of it, you know, a little bit, but it never happened again. Because what I told them then when they got in is these procedures are here to protect our lives. Yeah. And so you have to take them serious. A business continuity plan is no different. It may not not every business needs to protect their lives, but they've got to protect the livelihood of the business. And so everybody has to take those serious. And so making sure that you're testing and people know those like the fire drill in school, so that it's just snap your fingers. I know what to do when this happens. That's the important piece and most overlooked. Gosh, what a great illustration. Yeah. That's excellent. Yeah. Well, our sixth one is maintain and adapt. Yeah, so this, uh, the quick on that is that we see it now where we never thought about a technological component, just making sure, and you alluded to it earlier, that you're adapting and you're evolving, that it's not just collecting dust. That's the big component there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think about, you know, everyone is familiar with ransomware viruses now. 90% um, of them are delivered via email. Um, I, there was a time probably 12, 15 years ago when no one did know about ransomwares. So much like we've been talking to advise someone about something that might um, oh, encrypt your hard drive or something, people would say, well, you know, why would I want to worry about that? Why would I want to, to uh, protect myself from that? Well, it, the problem is that, that 80 to 95% to, uh, of all viruses are transmitted via email. 90% of ransomware is transmitted via email. So you would think training your employees on how to spot, um, you know, bad emails might be a, a concern. And yet, you know, most, most businesses don't do that. Now many do, you mentioned banking. Yeah. Most of them use, uh, well, I would say no before is probably the leader in that area, at least among banks. I've got several banking customers and clients and they all use that. Uh, there are some other ones that are, one actually just started um, that I think is going to be a, a promising company uh, in that area. They've got some other uh, benefits. But it, I guess my point is that when I do presentations, it, employee presentations, and I start talking about how these viruses work, how people are susceptible to them, I don't care who I'm talking to, uh, whether it's a company I spoke at a data privacy conference a few years ago, and these guys deal, they hold your and my medical records and all our other records. <laughs> yeah. Their eyes were this big. They had no idea it was that easy. Um, easy on, uh, for the hacker. Uh, it's easy to make a mistake too. So all of this stuff, main and adapt, uh, maintain and adapt, you've got to, uh, as I mentioned before, a living, breathing plan. Well, we've just got a few minutes. Let's talk about some of the biggest mistakes you see companies make in their business continuity planning. Yeah, I think um, uh, the obvious, Ron, is that first they, they don't have a plan. I think that by and large would be one of the things that I see. There's nothing really written down, you know, nothing really formal. The second thing that I see a lot of times is they don't have a risk assessment. So they haven't really went through and thought about the probability. And part of that is because I don't think that they understand the core or the strategy and, and that value chain. And so a lot of times you don't lay a priority on it. You know, one of the mistakes that I think that people make too, is that they, they only focus on it. 
you know, it becomes an IT thing rather than, like I said, the value chain. Do you have three suppliers uh, that, that are getting their products out of Wuhan right now or, you know, a couple months ago and then you can't get any product? You know, they haven't thought through those types of risk assessment. And IT isn't necessarily cybersecurity. I mean, there's they're, they're, they're cousins, if you will. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they think about IT and go, ah, I got everything in the cloud, I'm covered. And they haven't thought about that cyber piece. I think that's part of it. Uh, we kind of alluded to it on the other one uh, that uh, that's not step by step, you know, so you can't hand it off and somebody take over. I should be able to go when I was in banking, I should be able to go on a vacation for a week, be inaccessible and, and my team should be able just to step right in with a good continuity plan. It's step by step. Uh, senior executive support is one uh, not practice. We talked about the fire drill. The other um, that I see probably most is that uh, a lot of businesses don't consult third parties, which would be somebody like you, you know, as an example, they kind of, like you said, well, we got an IT guy, he's got us covered. Well, that, that may work uh, and, it, and it may not. And so those are things that, that you, you know, can run into, but that's usually what I see. Yeah, I, I would agree. In fact, other than financial services and hospitals, I won't say healthcare because hospitals are the only ones that I see any kind of planning in. Yeah. I don't see it in your smaller uh, clinics, your uh, uh, your you know doctors and dentists and, and what have you. Yeah. Most of them are, are just, they know they're not gonna be audited by HIPAA yeah. and um, um, they just, <laughs> They just really don't don't want to go there. Don't want to think there um, for whatever reason. Maybe they don't think they have the time. Uh, you mentioned downtime. In some companies, it can be as 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 high as millions of dollars a day if you're yeah, down. That's right. That's You've got right. all your employees uh, sitting there, and if you don't have electricity, what what are they going to do? Yeah. You're going to send them home. Well, what if the electricity comes up? You can't pay them to to um, to sit there, but at, a, at the same token, you can't send them home either. That's right. What do you do in that situation? Yeah. Same is true of networks, same is true of their website, if that's their main source of income. Yeah. I mean, there are, there are other examples. Um, you need to think this stuff through. Yeah, I'll give you a couple of thoughts, just a couple of quick, quick thoughts. But, uh, you know, when you think about flood, fire, tornado, you know, those types of things, uh, the, all that stuff can be cured with, uh, by and large, with technology, right? We're seeing that now, you know, where businesses are evolving and it took us a little while, but you have to figure out, you know, okay, let's all get on Zoom and let's kind of see how we do that. But just think about the technology piece. Think about a cyber attack that takes my system down. Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden you can. I asked the bank president just a couple, a couple weeks ago, I said, how many... How many of your tellers bank and, and bankers can calculate a principal and interest payment right now? If a customer said, I, I want to make a payment on my loan, you know, and, I, and I'd like to see what my balance is right now, you know, technology's down, so you probably can't find it. But even if you could, you remember how the tellers used to calculate back in the day, you know, then they, you'd make a payment and then they hand you your card back and you look at it and there's the balance. Everybody knew how to do that. Nobody knows how. And so when that technology is gone. And the other tip that I would give your, your listeners too, is I think, in my opinion, I just looking into the future, I think that all the things that we talked around a continuity plan, we could have talked about this for another day, couldn't we? I mean, just the, the cyber piece and that. But one of the things that I think that they need to consider is adding in their continuity plan around the loss of productivity, which is what you were just alluding to. How do we, when I, when I talk to business owners right now, Ron, what most people do is after, after they figured out they could do stuff on Zoom and they could reach out and, okay, so they lost one or two days and now we start to, you know, move people. These are not necessarily restaurants, but just more, just uh, uh, other functioning businesses. But what business leaders are telling me now is that they feel like their team's productivity is about 30 to 40% of what it was prior to the virus. Because you think about it, even I run into this now, I'm, I'm at home, but now I've got a wife at home, I've got two teenage boys at home, and so now it's dad, you know, can I do this, dad, can I, you know, I'm right in the middle of something. So productivity for people have dropped. And think about this, how long can a business maintain 30% productivity out of their employees, even if their revenues were going strong. So I think one of the things to leave people with on this is when you're doing your continuity plan, really sensitizing what would happen if your people were producing 30 to 40% of what they were before for one or two months. What does that do? 
Gosh, that's excellent. In fact, I'm going to make a note of that. Yeah. You know, um, as always, it is uh, it is a pleasure being with you. Uh, I always learn, and I trust the listeners are are going together quite a bit from this. One last time, tell folks how they can reach you if they want to reach out to you. Yeah, thank you for that, Ron. I think the easiest way is boilingfrogdevelopment at gmail.com is the easiest way. You can catch me on uh, Boiling Frog uh, on Facebook, uh, Larry Young on LinkedIn. You can message me. Either one of those ways works just fine. But uh, reach out if they just quick conversation to see kind of thoughts and kind of go from there. I appreciate it. Excellent. Well, thank you, everyone, for being with us today. You've been listening to the Information Playground. Uh, my special guest has been Larry Young, and it, as always, it's a pleasure with him. Uh, contact us. Uh, go to our, our website, ronbushconsulting.com. Uh, email ron at ronbushconsulting.com. Listen to us on wvlp.org or catch us on podcast or YouTube for the Information Playground. Thank you.